Hello everyone, this is uh, Norm from uh, Wide Oak Mobile Device Repair and today I want to, actually this evening, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to protect yourself um, eh, from viruses uh, and the news right now is the uh, WannaCry virus uh, or ransomware that's out there now and I'd like to talk a little bit about the different approaches um, that you can take really to help safeguard against any type of virus. Uh, what are the reasonable steps that you that you need to take in order to protect your most valuable things? Um, these are questions that I get asked very often <clears throat> so it's about time that I went ahead and, and did this video I, I guess. Um, so let's uh, dive right into it. Um, I'm going to talk a bit at first about some of the topics and then I'll go into um, Windows 10 and uh, I'll actually show you some examples uh, using a virtual machine so without further ado let's talk about this and I'm kind of calling this security 101 and I've broken it down into um, the approach I'm going to talk a little bit about passwords and then probably the second most important thing which is backups so under mind mindset you, you ha when you're approaching this you have to have a defensive and a proactive stance um, with anything with computers you if, you know you, you don't want to be you want to put all your eggs in one basket um, to use a cliche uh, and there really is no silver bullet out there uh, you know I, I often get asked you know what kind of uh, antivirus can I install to help protect my computer well antivirus is just but one component of uh, of an overall strategy on how a consumer can help safeguard their data um, and if you're thinking of in that little box where I can just get a small piece of software um, or pay a subscription fee to a, a company then then you're looking at it wrong and you're setting yourself up for failure um, at the start so um, you also have to as I said here that you have to understand that there's no such thing as or uh, any um, a secure system when you are connected to the internet um, the only truly secure system and, and even that can probably be, be, be hacked uh, using you know social engineering and such is one that's not connected to other computers it, it sits there by itself and it does nothing to to, to be very handy uh, in, in the interconnected world that we live in so it doesn't go out to Google and you know out on the internet and, and you can't look up information it only serves as a single function um, and that's to, to do whatever job it is uh, and that's a secure system you know and, and only one person has access to it or very few people have access to that system and the outside world can't reach it and even to a degree the inside world inside the uh, corporate environment uh, or even government environment cannot get into it um, that would definitely be a secure system but outside of that if you're connected to the internet or even if your computer's not connected to the internet but maybe connected to um, a local network that somewhere or somewhere along the, the, the uh, somewhere down the line is connected to the internet your computer is not safe and it will never be safe um, because there's always a way to get in there um, <laughs> the and it brings up this topic here where I, I tend to talk about how um, there's no safety whatsoever um, from a targeted attack so if somebody identifies you uh, whether it's a state actor or um, a bunch of script kiddies or something like that if they target you um, and they focus all their attention on you they are going to get in 
<laughs> there's just no question about it. Um, you know, most people they, they don't get caught up in, in the drag nets and, and the large um, bot nets and, 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 and things like that um, as a targeted uh, object. Your computer becomes infected with something, and then it gets attached to um, to the larger organization, um, whether uh, in the botnet or something like that. But it, it's not used against you or your, your your equipment. Your computer equipment is not used against you per se. It's just used to carry out attacks that are targeted towards other organizations. So um, that is how I like uh, you know I like to put it, and it, it, that you have to really realize that that if somebody has says puts a target on you they are going to get into your system um, and so uh, in, in there's no amount of encryption or <laughs> you know no amount of uh, of you know preventative m measures that you can take uh, and especially from state actors uh, as I have here you know uh, the US Russia China the UK Israel even um, those large state actors you just can't hide from those things and I think um, as the Vault 7 release that uh, the Wikipedia did uh, or not Wikipedia excuse me WikiLeaks <laughs> yeah, from th that that basically tells us that the the governments uh, of the world the US government and in several others they know of hardware flaws um, inside computers one might even say that some of these flaws were Quite possibly designed that way, um, you know. But you can speculate that. There's no absolute proof of that, at least that I haven't seen. But certainly, there, there's been talk about things um, that some of the code, especially the stuff that uh, has gone on recently with Intel, um, you know, the code was just it, it was written in such a fashion that anybody who works at Intel would have to really be fudging the fudging it to to write code that way um, but I digress on, on that point the point being is that you are not going to be able to conceal your information from a state actor or a targeted attack against you um, ever uh, if you are on a connected computer or a computer that has ever been connected to the internet so that being said, what can you do? Um, you need to think of in the in the overall process. How am I going to deal with the aftermath of a targeted attack, um, where my computer has been uh, compromised by ransomware or malware and it's infested? What do I need to save, um, and how do I get it from point A to point B? and then put it back onto my computer once it's been restored. That's what you need to be thinking of, is my backup strategy. How do I recover um, ex post facto, uh, really? Um, and that's where we look at going into the cloud and using cold storage. So I'm going to go over that um, briefly. Um, so. Your first line of defense is your password. Um, your password, it, it, I cannot be stressed enough. It should not be, you know, people trust me, uh, um, however wrongly or rightly, with their secret information when they bring their computers or they bring their you know, laptops to me or their, their um, tablets and PCs and, and they have sensitive information on them and oftentimes they'll give me their password so that I can access their information um, and the passwords that I typically see um, you know if you're really really close to me and I feel very comfortable with you uh, and I know you're not going to take it the wrong way I'll give you the password lecture <laughs> um, which I'm probably going to I'm going to kind of get into now um, but if I don't know you, I might just give you that look like, mm, you know, <laughs> you can't see it. Um, but most passwords that I see that people use, it's their weakest point in their, uh, in their single point of failure is their password. It can be broken and cracked um, and, and compromised very easily 
um, in a targeted attack. And so your first line of defense is coming up with a good password. Um, so let's talk about what makes a good password. Now, a password length, um, it, 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 the length of your password, the longer it is, the better it's going to be. Okay. Um, I, I have here is just a general guideline. It should be a minimum of nine characters. And I mean, that's the absolute most minimum you should do if you're creating a meaningful password. Like, you know, my dog loves, you know, my dog loves um, ham and cheese. <laughs> um, uh, for a very strong password, the beginnings, I like to target at least 16 characters. Uh, I'm looking for that. Um, at least the bare minimum that the length of it is going to be 16 characters. Um, a passphrase is much better than a password. Now, a passphrase would be um, something like um, alpha, omega, beta, um, theta, blah, 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 you know, one, two, three, um, or four score and seven years ago. There, you can make a passphrase out of something like that. It's easy to remember, um, uh, and if you add some special characters in there and stuff, it it can throw it up or it, it can spin it up a little bit and and make it a little bit harder for an attacker to to guess what it is. Now, I personally know of uh, some reports out there. That you know, most passwords given up to about 60 characters that are low entry, entropy passwords, and that will be considered a low entropy password. Um, they can be cracked in just a few minutes um, because uh, the way they can the way they can dice them up and and guess um, guess words that make up the password, and eventually you can just compromise that entire key. Um, so what you're shooting for then? For an absolutely secure um, password, is a high entropy password, and by entropy uh, and high entropy, I mean more randomization, a, a total ra randomization. So, um, to show you on the screen, I'll, I'll put in something like this would be a high entropy password. It's just random gobbledygook, you know, that, that is upper and lowercase includes. You know, punctuation, and it's extremely, extremely long. The longer, the better. If you can get upwards north of, you know, 60 or 100 characters, it's great. The downside to that, and the problem is, which I bet you're, you've already said as you're listening to this, is, well, how on earth would I ever remember something like that? And that's when I want to introduce you to LastPass. And LastPass is just, it's been around for... Um, I first start, heard of it about a year ago, uh, maybe a little bit less than a year ago. Um, but LastPass really is um, the, the, the it's a service that's uh, cloud-based where um, it'll generate automatically generate high entropy passwords for you and store those credentials in the last um, LastPass vault for you for the websites you log on. So Facebook, Gmail. Um, Yahoo, um, you know, or any any website that you may visit, Amazon, uh, PayPal, all of those can it, it just automatically grabs um, with a it's a browser plugin works across all operating systems um, and pretty much all the big major um, all the major uh, browsers and it's on uh, it's on Android and iOS as an app. Um, and it's amazingly simple to use, and it gives you a very, very tight security model that, that if somebody um, just happens to I don't know, crack your Amazon account and your and your in your LastPass password, or they have a breach um, such as the one they had with with Target not too long ago or a few years back, where they they captured something like 50 million passwords or 50 million user accounts or something like that. Um, and you get caught up in it, it's no big deal. You go in, you log into the site, you do the, you know, you generate a new new high entropy password, and your account's secure again. Um, and 
it's near impossible to brute force uh, and, and to do that. So I, I would highly recommend, and I'll put some um, notes and I'll put a, I'll put a link to uh, to fast to last pass, fast pass. Uh, yeah, I'm a Disney fan. What can I say? <laughs> Um, I will put a link uh, in in the uh, in the description here uh, to LastPass for you. Highly recommend you jump on that and, and familiarize yourself with it. There's some YouTube videos out there on how to use it. Um, maybe I might do one uh, in the not too distant future if there is enough um, interest in that, or even if there's not, it just seems like a worthy cause. So. Um, Again, here's the. This is a good low entropy password. Um, hunting, fishing, loving, you know, 24/7. Um, you know, it, 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 that would be a pretty decent password. But again, out there in the wild, you know, there there are programs that can crack that pretty easily because it has the word hunting or hunting, fish in love in <laughs> um, and, and those can be can be guessed uh, pretty pretty you know, so you, you can get a pretty big picture of it pretty quickly um, a better option is to have a, a passphrase as I said a passphrase is it, it would be you know a set of, of words that are easy enough and in the specific order that that you can remember them um, and then uh, of course the best option is this high entropy password? This is actually I generated this password. Uh, it's a hundred characters long from LastPass because they have a, a a random password generator there that you don't have to store with anything. You can just generate a password, copy it, and paste it into uh, a local account somewhere. So this was actually something that it just generated automatically and spit it out for me. Um, so so let's talk a little bit about some disclaimers. <laughs> um, I think I've already been over this. Um, you can see how much better a passphrase would be, and because of the length of it, it would be a, a bit more difficult to to crack. Um, but it's not a panacea. Um, you will run into sites where they um, oftentimes will have a a a limitation. Um, that's basically a limitation in whatever database that they're using that will only accept an eight character password and sometimes uh, the, you can really you can narrow it down um, and tell which database they're using or, or, or you can eliminate a whole lot of them when it's when they say all right well you can only use upper and lower case characters and numbers and maybe no special special punctuation or things like that and by the length that, that the password field allows you can really narrow it down to which databases or, or what good candidates of databases that they're using on the back end based on those constraint constraints um, built into that model. Um, sites like that, I personally don't like those those type of sites and if I'm forced to use something like that, I use a a a throwaway password. I'll come up with something very simple because usually those sites are very insecure and it's rare that they're significant enough for me um, or the, that the information or the service that they're providing, I'm not going to give them any um, information such as a credit card or or um, you know social security number or any highly secretive or sensitive information. If they don't have um, a good security model or their model just doesn't seem to mesh with me, I'm not going to give them that sensitive information that then could be compromised by an attacker and then taken uh, and used against me at some other time in the future. Just is not going to happen. And I would highly advise you to be aware of the type of sites that you're logging into. Um, and, you know, LastPass will, will handle this for you. It, it, um, and so it's not so much that you have to, have to, um, to keep that in mind as far as the password is concerned, but based on the complexity rules and the requirements that are the, that they're asking of you to log into and, and use their website can tell you an awful lot about what types of information you would or you should not give them. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And so um, if, if they allow um, 
a randomly generated 100 character, um, uh, you know, a password, there's a pretty good safe bet that that uh, their security is good enough that you might it, it might qualify to be able to hand over um, sensitive information to them. Um, but you know, when they start moving down, where they're saying, well, you can have a maximum of eight characters or a maximum of ten characters. Yeah, I, I don't trust that. So, homie, don't play that. <laughs> um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the layered um, approach to passwords that I've given this information in the, in the past, uh, or, or this little talk to people in the past. Um, you... Again, when you're looking at websites uh, or, or somewhere that you're going to give information to, um, if you're commenting on a blog like my blog, for instance, um, and, and you're logging into that blog, uh, you know, you really don't care that your user account comes compromised. It, it, and so it's not as crucial for you to, to have a password and that is a high entry password or super secure account um, because the worst thing that somebody can do is come in and delete all your all your comments um, you know so I, I have a standard you know one two three four five six um, password it's easy to use and you know if I want to log in and uh, to a site that I don't really care about and, and that I'm never going to give them any more information other than a username and a password <laughs> And maybe make a couple of, um, of comments on a blog or something like that. You know, I can go ahead and use a simple password like that: uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, or you know, ABC or QWERTY or something like that. That's very common, very easy to remember. Um, when you get up in th to the next level, where you have social media and the information that that, that say Facebook um, uh, keeps about you, uh, and the, the the details that that you know privately. If somebody gets into your Facebook account, the damage that they could do, you want to have a stronger password for certain. Um, again, to pre prevent to help prevent a brute force attack of some sort. Um, so Facebook, uh, Google Plus, and and things the websites of that caliber, uh, you you want to have um, a password that is a lot more complex than just your standard QWERTY or one two three four five six. <laughs> Um, and QWERTY, by the way, for those who are, are unsure, is the um, top row of the uh, of a standard 104 keyboard, uh, QWERTY. Um, it's a very common password uh, and, and that people use uh, sometimes for secure sites. Uh, just that blows my mind that, that people do that. And then lastly, when you're talking about bank accounts and healthcare and work credentials and you know, uh, anywhere that you need to do it, so applying for a visa or a passport or something like that, where the information is just, you, you really, you know, you trust the website because they do their, their highest, they, they have, you know, super strong security, um, and the information that they have, you know, um, if they're PCI compliant and things like that, the, the, the information that they're storing about you is super sensitive. That's when you really want to go to a very complex password preferably the high entropy but if not a high entropy password if you're not going to use LastPass at least make something up that is a combination of a passphrase with upper and lowercase numbers and care and characters and, and something along those lines um, but that's the information that you really need to guard against um, so and I've talked already about this um, now Two-factor authentication, 2FA, is is when um, okay you've got your your user ID and your password, but then there's this third component to it um, where it's usually they're going to send you an email or they're going to send you a text message to your phone. 2FA, um, two-factor authentication, is something that. Um, I hear some people complain about, but it, once you realize that how well it protects you and how great of an idea 2FA is, um, you really should 
you you should be excited about that and hope to see that everybody implements two uh, two factor authentication. Um, I know I use um, uh, uh, accounting software that has two uh, two FA in, enabled. So every time I log on, actually, um, it, I can set it up to period intervals. Um, it, you know, so I can say every every day, every twenty four hours, or every seven days, or every fourteen days, and I think a maximum of thirty days. Um, Reauthenticate through 2FA per device. So, you know, when I log in um, and I have it set to every day, the next morning when I go to log in, um, it's going to say, All right, you've got the password right, you've got the username right. Now we just need to send you a text message to the phone that we have record on, on, on file for you. This one time use, um, you know, sometimes four digits, sometimes six, and I've seen up to eight digit randomly generated um, code to say yes this is you what a fantastic idea um, and it's a great leap forward in preventing um, unauthorized access to your account um, because you know immediately hey I, I, I if somebody wants to authenticate against you and you get that text message and you didn't do it you know something fishy is going on you can immediately take measures to shut the account down lock it out change passwords do whatever you need to do um, to, to get to it, so <laughs> uh, 2FA is is something that is really just fantastic. The next form of 2FA um, is is a little key fob. Um, YubiKey or YubiCo is the is the company that makes it, um, and it's uh, it's it's similar in that uh, to two factor authentication, uh, but uh, you, instead of getting a text message or even signing in, it's similar, more similar to LastPass in that once you authenticate with this little USB key, um, all you ever need to do is authenticate that you have that key uh, to log in. So um, an example would be Amazon.com. You you go ahead, you set up your YubiKey um, to log into uh, Amazon with it. And it'll check you know, the software running on your computer against the hardware that's plugged into your USB port. Um, and if, if both exist and the keys get exchanged and everything's fine, it just automatically logs you in. There's no putting in your user ID and no passwords and nothing like that. You, um, and YubiKey handles it all in the back. Disconnect it and it no longer authenticates. Um, a very good idea. I've never, I've not personally used one. I've toiled with the idea, but honestly, with LastPass, I find that it's going to be easier, um, and I don't have to rely on hardware um, that has the potential of getting lost or getting broken. And Lord knows, I am really bad with hardware. Um, uh, you know, so I, there, there's that little trust pat factor for me that um, I don't like, but some people may may like the idea of, of YubiKey, um, and overall, it's, you know, I'm not opposed to them, and I think if somebody is comfortable using a YubiKey, that's a great thing, and I, I personally would encourage that, um, uh, you know, uh, some sort of mechanism that is a, uh, you know, a third mechanism to authenticate yourself. Um, all right, so... Now we're getting down to um, the meat of it. So I want to shift from passwords into the actual preventative measures that we can take. Um, so we want, if, if your accounts become, or if your computer becomes compromised by malware or uh, or something bad, or you know, you have a simple hardware fa failure. Um, the hard drive uh, dies on you uh, to the point where it, the data either can't be recovered or it becomes too expensive to recover. It. You need to have a backup, and so just to simplify things here, because you know some people really don't understand what a backup is, and in their mind, a backup is some lofty piece of software. <laughs> that you have to have uh, uh, running in the background and it does incremental things. That's all fine, well, and good, and there's software out there. But what essentially a backup is, is a new good copy of a file. So you have your working file that you're working on, and then you have a copy of 
the last time you worked on it or a good copy of it that if you are working on it and something working on the file um, live and something happens to it um, or you make a mistake or something like that you can always go back to the the second file that copy of it and overwrite or replace the the data so that, that's all that's all it is is a known good copy so what we're talking about then is instead of one file is how do I encapsulate all of my files how do I get a known good copy of all my files somewhere else other than on my hard drive and that's when you look at using cold storage and cloud storage now cold storage is you're storing your media offline onto backup media so um, whether it's CDs or a USB drive or an external hard drive um, or you know or, or even a, a NAS server or, or something like that you're taking your files that, that, that are good on your computer and you're moving copies of them from there to the cloud or, or to, to a, a a removable device that's going to eventually be offline um, and, and accessible. Uh, cold storage is, is great because it can exist in multiple places as a snapshot in time basically um, that is inaccessible from um, malicious actors that are remote. You know, if somebody lo locally just you know comes by and, and they see a you know a USB key and they lift your key from you, well, there's nothing you can do about that directly um, we can talk about encryption at some other time but you know they have that copy of it but the big the, you know the big problem here that we're trying to solve is what happens if remotely my, my files are compromised or you know I have a hardware failure and so getting those files we can use the simple copy command you know where you right click on a file copy it paste it into your USB key. Um, another file or a program that I've used uh, and I use all the time is Robocopy. Uh, <clears throat> Robocopy has been included with Microsoft um, since I think Windows 7. Prior to Windows 7, heck it might even be Windows Vista. Prior, prior to that it was a, uh, an external utility that you had to go to um, uh, Microsoft to, to download and it, I think it was System Internals that originally um, created it, or somebody did. did, did. But anyways, it's a good tool that can help you um, mirror directories and do uh, do file copies over a network, or from one one hard drive to another hard drive, or from a hard drive to a USB key or a backup um, hard drive. It, it, it's a it's an amazing tool. Um, and it's in some ways it's a clone of, or in some ways it's actually better than R Sync, which is on Linux and Mac, um, and and Unix, um, most Unix distributions that are out there. Um, you know, <laughs> and then there's there's other programs um, that that'll do this for you. Uh, I'm drawing a blank now. Um, to, to give a good example of, of, a, of, a, of a third party utility but there are other third third party utilities out there that you can use um, I think Western Digital and Samsung all have some some type of built-in and SanDisk uh, they have some little utilities that are included with all of their USB keys that you can install and it'll run incremental backups uh, if you want it to and it's free as long as you you know you, as long as you're writing to their product um, so to give you an example of a robocopy command um, because I, I, I'm a, that much of a believer in it I think you, you know if you go to the command prompt and you type in robocopy space um, so I'll do here say robocopy space and then the question mark and then press enter and that's going to give you uh, a very detailed um, help page uh, to, to tell you all your options. I, I would read through those options if you really are that, that interested in using Robocopy 
and getting very familiar with it. There's probably tons of YouTube videos out there. There's TechNet, ar TechNet articles on Microsoft's um, TechNet and uh, MSDN. I think he even has some articles on it. Um, th th there's there's no shortage of information on how to use um, Robocopy. But the most typical way is you say Robocopy and then the source directory or source file. Um, in this case, we're going to talk about directories. Your source directory, the destination, so where you want it to go to. You use the mirror switch, MIR, uh, capital MIR, um, which tells it to mirror this directory um, in the output. Uh, the Z switch. Uh, I forget off the top of my head what the Z switch does. Um, oh, the Z switch I think tells you to um, it tells it to to continue from uh, large uh, to to be able to continue copying large files on error. Uh, I believe that's what it was. Um, the W is the wait of the pause five seconds. If it, if it hits a file and it has trouble copying it, it, it it'll um, pause uh, and try up to three times. And then, of course, you can put the output to a log file. Um, I've used this plus sign here so that it'll append the log. So, you know, if you're going to run this in the background as a, um, a, it's, as a scheduled job on Windows, that it runs every day at such and such a time and it calls it from a script, it'll append a file so that you can go back into that file and look and say, all right, so this is what it copied over, and it'll give you a nice summary and say it copied 7,583 files, you know, um, and it skipped uh, these three files because it aired out. It's, it's pretty detailed, and all in plain text. Um, so I highly recommend you try uh, Robocopy. And, of course, you can name the log file anything you want. I just call it robolog.txt um, just for the purposes here. And then finally, we have cloud storage. Now, cloud storage, um, that, that, you know, it's it's a buzzword, but really it does describe it. Um, you're you're taking your files. You're you are then synchronizing your local copy out on the internet to a remote server somewhere to either Dropbox or Amazon Prime. Now, Amazon Prime is a special case because they only back up your um. Uh, your 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 photo files. I, I don't think they do video, and they certainly don't do documents. They may do video. Um, they don't do documents or or any other files. It's just um, JPEG and PNG, BMPs, um, and so forth. Then there's Mega.co on um, .nz. Uh, they have a, a sync client um, available on all OSs. Uh, and the thing I like about Mega is that um, they give you. I, 50 or 100 gigabytes of free storage and then over that you pay I think 10 bucks a month or something like that uh, it's ridiculously cheap whatever it is um, and they don't store any personal information about you um, so when you uh, I personally I do use mega um, and you can use they don't verify an email with you so you can go up there and your email is the first portion of your key uh, so you could say you know, abc at 123.com and then put in a password, and that's going to be your login. Um, it, it doesn't really care. Um, it, it, it doesn't know anything. They don't ask you what your name is. They don't ask you where you live, where you're from. Um, and so if you if you want to do some reading, uh, I would suggest you read up a little bit on uh, who Kim.com is and his plight. Uh, he is the creator of Mega.co. Uh, mega.co.nz and um, he's a very interesting character <laughs> and he's got an interesting story and of course um, there's iCloud and OneDrive and the, the example I'm going to get ready to get into is using OneDrive um, OneDrive because uh, I would probably say 95% of those people that are paying attention to this video right now if I still have you with me um, you are going to be on a Microsoft Windows 10 or Windows 7 PC uh, or Windows 8.1 or Windows 8 or 8.1 uh, PC at some point in time. Um, and so it's the most accessible without having to do anything else. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, Alrighty, 
I'm going to fire up VMware. And I thought I had my Windows 10 running. Ah, so I did. I, I just shut it down for something. That's nah, okay. Yeah, in. Yeah, this is my my uh, test account. So we're logged into Yoda's uh, virtual machine here. And if you look down here, um, yeah, this is the OneDrive icon. Okay. And so I've logged into to OneDrive already. Now what OneDrive does when you go through and you do the initial configuration of it um, is it puts a folder on your, your computer called OneDrive. Uh, and so now if you create a file in your documents folder, so I'm going to just create a, a small text file, new uh, text document, uh, hello one. All right, and then we're just going to say hello YouTube. That in and of itself did not do anything. There was no backup going on in here. This is just me saving a file to my documents folder. Um, now, I have OneDrive on here. You can take and copy. So we'll do copy. And we can go over here to paste it and paste it in the OneDrive. Boom. Now you see that it had that little, um, the, the, the uh, circular error, the blue errors. Uh, it, it, it was synchronizing that file, so it's already copied it. Now it's got the green check mark next to it. Um, that's letting you know that that file has been synchronized. So there's a copy of it here locally, and then there's a copy somewhere on Microsoft's Azure servers um, in Seattle or wherever they have them located all around the world. Bear with me; I had to get a, a sip of uh, something cool to drink. So that's one way to do it. This is a decent setup, and it's decent enough if you're somebody who um, is, is a user who only has, uh, you, you generate a lot of files, but the files that you don't care about are, are, are things that you really don't care about, and the things that you do care about are few in number. They're not great in number. Um, and so, you know, you may occasionally have a picture from your, uh, from your phone or, or, or a digital camera that you want to you know, back up to the cloud or something, you can just take and drag and drop it in there. Or there's a special PDF or, or something like that that you need a copy of, you drag and drop it in there. But all the other stuff that you generate, you don't really care about, you know, this gives you a good segregation. And so something happens to it or you delete it all, um, you know, you, you don't care about that information. It's cleaned out. Um, so, you know, I, I don't care about that. It's no longer here. Um, but it is still in my OneDrive. Uh, and so there's a copy of it, and I can access this from a different computer. You know, I can log on, um, say this is my work computer, I can log on at my house and, and go to my OneDrive, and there it is. The downside to it is if you're somebody like me, who the majority of the stuff that I generate are things that. I, you know, I am concerned about, and there are things that, and I think most of us are going to be fall in this category, where we want that information to automatically be synchronized. We don't want to have to go and think about, do I copy this over to OneDrive or do I not? You know, we just want it to automatically happen to, in the background. We can solve that problem pretty quickly. So what we can do is, um, and I'm going to back out of here. We can stop and uh, exit. Yep, we're going to uh, exit the OneDrive right now. So we, we want to stop it. We're no longer synchronizing. So we open up Explorer and we go to our OneDrive. And for grins, we're going to do documents. I'm going to I'm going to create a new folder in here. That folder I'm going to call documents. And then I'll do the same thing for pictures. I'll do folder pictures. Okay, 
So I've created two new brand new folders inside the OneDrive folder, Documents and Pictures. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to Documents here. I'm going to right click on it and I want to go look at the properties on it. Now, over here, there's this tab, Location. I want to change the default location of it. So I'm going to do Move. And I'm going to go to OneDrive. And I'm going to say, there's the new location of that folder. So now it's going to go to C, Users, Yoda, OneDrive, and Documents. You hit Apply. Yes, just fine. Yes, we still want to proceed. We say OK. And then we come back to Pictures. S repeat, rinse and repeat. Go to Location. We move. I'm going to look at my, my OneDrive. So I'm going to access it this way. I'm going to OneDrive, expand it. There's Pictures. Say, yep, that's the one I want. Apply. Yes. Yes. And I say, OK. Now, I'm going to go here to OneDrive and inside here, I'm going to move this for grins. Now, I'm going to click on my Documents folder. Actually, I'll, uh, we'll go this way. I'll go into C, Users, Yoda, and then what you're used to seeing. Okay. Then I go to, oh, no, I'm going to go to Documents. And I'm going to drag this in here. Now I've saved my um, my my hello file that was on my desktop here, and it it is automatically synchronized. Of, oh, so I'm sorry. No, it's not. I've got to restart. <laughs> um, I've got to re-log into uh, OneDrive. So let's start back up. So now you see, there we go, it, it synchronized real quick. And now, anytime I drag and drop or, or put files in my documents folder, it makes a symbolic link uh, to, it, to the actual location, which is now in OneDrive. And now everything I do is synchronized and, and put up into the cloud. Um, so same thing for pictures. I'll go on here, um, we'll download a picture. Um, why oak tree? And pardon me, this is a little bit slow because, well, it's a virtual machine. There we go. So I'll do images and There's the wire tree, and as it as as it um, fell down, and then I'll say, "All right, I'm gonna." You see a little icon there now, the little check mark. It's there. I'm gonna save it, and then you'll notice that inside that just is synchronizing, and inside here. That wire tree file that I automatically saved to my pictures file is now synchronized up with OneDrive. Um, and there's a great way to uh, to combat this. So now, uh, if your computer gets compromised uh, and you have to reinstall the OS, then it's fairly simple. You know, from that point on, you, you can uh, just simply log into you know after you after you reinstall the operating system and you clean out you know, this and start anew, you log into to OneDrive. And then it just automatically starts pulling those files back down to you to your computer. And there's nothing else other than a, a high-speed internet connection that that's really needed from you. And then we, you know, you re-alter the, uh, the the links like I just did, uh, so that it's, it starts starts synchronizing again. But other than that, you're the, the most important. The things that are most important to you are automatically captured and they're taken care of you or taken care of for you on your behalf. Um, 
so that if something happens and the, 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 you don't have to worry about it. You've got those those baby pictures and the birthday party pictures and the, the pictures of of the, of the, your your passed away relatives uh, the, 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 and those things that you can never get back. Now they are taken care of for you automatically, um, and you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and and so if your hard drive fails, it's just a simple matter of replacing the hard drive. Reinstalling the operating system and logging into um, OneDrive or Mega or, or, or whatever you, you, you whatever you're using um, to to do your cloud backup. Same thing um, using Robocopy. You know you're going to have a, a backup of it. And I'll I'll, I'll probably do a, a, another video uh, actually going through how to use Robocopy and give examples of it. Um, but copying it to a, a uh, cold storage. It's just a matter of reinstalling the operating system at this point, reloading your applications or e and your programs, and then pulling out the photos or that you want or the documents that you that you want. So, I hope this helps everybody or, or somebody. If it does, leave me some good comments and uh, and uh, I will provide links in the description. Um, thank you and God bless.